This episode contains discussions of kidnapping and child death. If that isn't something you want to hear about, this may be a good episode to skip. I'd like to apologize in advance for my pronunciation of Icelandic words and names. I'm not a native speaker, and although I used a guide, I'm sure I won't get it quite right. As a non-Icelander, I tried my best to use resources by Icelandic authors. This involved reading translations, which may not have captured the exact stories and feelings associated. My apologies for that as well. Humans are fascinated by gore and violence, but even more so the mysterious and unsolved. Interest in these disturbing and unpleasant subjects is called morbid curiosity, and it has gripped millions of people throughout the ages. I am one of those people. My name is Hallie, and this is the Morbid Curiosity Podcast. In December of 2020, I wrote an essay for the Plague Pit tier patrons on some of the characters from the Yuletide traditions of Iceland. This bit of folklore was very different from what I grew up with, and it stayed with me. The creatures and characters that caught my attention were Grilla and her family, mischievous and sometimes downright terrifying beings. Grilla is a monstrous troll or ogre who has many sons known as the Yule Lads and a giant ferocious cat. All were believed to terrorize the children of Iceland in the days leading up to Yule, what we would call midwinter or Christmas. Most of these tales seem to originate in the 13th century, but only became associated with Yuletide in the 19th century. Before we get to the folk tales, a little context is needed, as Iceland is quite a unique place in both geology and history. Iceland is a sub-Arctic island that is kept relatively warm due to the North Atlantic Current. Many volcanoes, geysers, and other geothermal features exist across the island, but 63% of it is tundra, with very few trees and quite rocky terrain. There are also fjords, highlands, glaciers, lava fields, and mountains, and most of the population lives along the coast. Most Icelanders are descendants of Norse and Gaelic settlers and take pride in that Scandinavian heritage. Iceland is the least populated country in Europe and is sort of on its own in the middle of the Norwegian Sea. Despite this isolation and the desolate nature of the land, or perhaps because of it, independence is a national value. According to medieval Icelandic texts, such as the Landnama book, the Book of Settlements, a group of Irish monks lived on the island before Scandinavian settlers arrived around 850 CE. In 60 or so years, at least 10,000 people, mostly from Norway, had emigrated to Iceland in small ships, because the land was quite difficult to farm and settle, supplies were often pillaged from Europe. Still, development of society in Iceland was limited by the lack of resources. They created their own social order, a decentralized self-government, which was guided by an assembly of freemen called the Althing, which was established around 930 CE. Iceland remained independent for 300 years, Christianity came to the island at the end of the 10th century through influence by Norwegian king Olaf Tryggvason. In the mid-13th century, 44 years of internal conflict, called the Age of the Sturlungs, made Iceland vulnerable. It came under Norwegian rule by the end of the 13th century. The Kalmar Union, formed in 1397, uniting the kingdoms of Norway, Denmark, and Sweden all came under Danish rule after Sweden's secession from the Union in 1523. 
Although the Danish kingdom forcefully introduced Lutheranism, a sect of Christianity, in 1550, Iceland remained a semi-colonial territory, so Danish institutions and infrastructures had less impact on them for a time. However, the strict Danish trade monopoly in the 17th and 18th centuries was detrimental to the Icelandic economy, resulting in hardship and population decline. An independence movement grew in the 19th century, and the Althing was restored. After World War I, Iceland regained its independence. It was peacefully occupied by the UK in 1940 to prevent Nazi invasion. In 1944, all ties with Denmark, which was still under Nazi occupation at the time, were severed. Iceland joined the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, and the United Nations, but stayed out of the European Union, still prioritizing its independence. And now on to the folktales. Iceland has a long history of belief in supernatural creatures, both mundane and fantastical. We covered elves, also known as the Hidden People, in our Huldefolk episode in 2019, but the Hidden People are only a small feature of Icelandic mythology and folklore. This lore was recorded quite early in Iceland's history as well, so we can easily look back on it. The Prose Edda is one of the earliest examples of documentation of Iceland's folklore. It was written, or perhaps collected, by famous Icelandic politician, poet, and historian Snorri Sturluson around 1220 CE. The collection relates much of what is known about Norse mythology, including descriptions of the nine parallel worlds that are supported by the great world tree, Yggdrasil. It also tells the story of the Aesir, the principal Norse pantheon of gods, such as Odin, Thor, and Loki, who are still well-known characters all over the Western world thanks to the Marvel franchise. Trolls are a common feature in Icelandic folklore, usually seen abducting children or turning to stone in the sunlight. One of the most famous trolls was an ogress called Grilla, whose story was used by Icelandic parents to scare their children into behaving. Something along the lines of, if you don't behave, Grilla will come and take you away. Often called a troll or an ogre, Grilla is described as looking like a mix between a troll, a human, and an animal. She had horns, hooves, fangs, one to several tails, and sometimes many eyes. She could smell children from very far away, but she only liked the smell of naughty children. While the origin of her name is unknown, the old Norwegian word grilla means howl or growl. It's also been translated as meaning terror. Grilla was infamous in her time, with most children knowing her stories and fearing her from a young age. While the stories vary, they all agree her favorite pastime was eating naughty children. Usually, parents would designate a hill near their home, telling their children Grilla lived there. Other tales state that she and her monstrous family lived in the daunting lava fortress of Dimuborgir, located in the Mivaden area of North Iceland. If she heard children misbehaving, she would show up, put them in a sack, and drag them back to her home, where she would then make them into stew. The first written mentions of Grilla come from the 13th century. In the prose Edda, the Sverre Saga, a collection of stories about King Sverre Sigurdsson of Norway, and the Islandinga Saga, which is a history of Iceland before the 13th century. The casual usage of her name and character in all of these references suggests her tale is much older than these written stories, so old that knowledge of her was assumed. In these earliest accounts, Grilla is described as a repulsive ogre woman begging for disobedient children to eat. Each of her tales grasped a sack in which she held the children she meant to turn into stew. She was run out of town long ago and therefore inhabited the mountains. 
Grilla was said to have been married several times, but when she grew bored of her husbands, she ate them. Her third husband, called Lepalodi, doesn't play much part in her story, either because he's lazy or so whipped that he hides at home all day. The two have many children, which vary in number depending on the era. All the children are male and are modernly called the Yule Lads. Originally, Grilla and the other characters I'll talk about in a moment had no link to the midwinter holidays. It was in the 15th century that she was first mentioned alongside Yuletide, known as Jol in Icelandic. In a poem by Gudmundur Erlendsen, a priest of the fast-spreading Christian faith, Grilla was transformed slightly, described as more of a vagabond coming down from the mountains to catch children. She tried to spend the night in children's homes, but couldn't stand the sound of Christmas carols or lights. She complained of hunger, as all the children were too well-behaved. In the 20th century, Grilla became firmly associated with Yuletide, thanks to a 1932 book called Christmas is Coming by Johannes Ur Kotlum. The collection was hugely popular and contained poems about Grilla, the Yule Lads, and the Yule Cat. The book established that the ogres were the parents of the Yule Lads and also popularized the idea that Grilla had died from hunger long ago. The story of her death didn't stick, however, and she returned even more changed in later years as a big-boned housewife, merely the mother of the Yule Lads. The Yule Lads currently number 13, but have ranged from as little as 8 to as many as 20. Their numbers and looks used to vary depending on location within Iceland. There were some consistencies, though. All the lads were troll-like, enormous, filthy, unintelligent, and bestial, and would turn to stone in sunlight. Their mischievous deeds were also quite consistent. In 1862, Icelandic author and museum director Jan Arneson published a collection of oral Icelandic folktales in which the 13 Yule Lads appeared during the 13 days leading up to Christmas Eve. Arneson was also the first to name all 13 lads, and he based the names on each lad's favorite pranks. These pranks range from mischievous to disgusting. The first of the Yule Lads to begin stirring up trouble was Stakjestur, or Sheet Caught Clod. He harassed the sheep of any household he came across. In the past, Icelanders kept their sheep underground in the winter months, so when the sounds of bleating would echo up into the house, it was thought that Stakjastur had found them. Sheep were the lifeblood of every farmstead, so this sound was troubling, but all too common. The best thing to do was to wait it out. He'd move on to your neighbor's sheep soon enough. Though he was a fearsome troll, Stakjastur had very stiff legs, which impaired his ability to move. Giljegir, or Gulligok, was the second Icelandic Yule lad to arrive in human settlements. Hiding in nearby gullies, he waited until the humans fell asleep and then broke into their cow sheds to steal milk. Milk was a key ingredient in many Yuletide sauces, as well as skir. Similar to modern Western Christmas, the food during Yuletide was particularly splendid. The best and most traditional of these dishes in Iceland is skir, a creamy and also healthy dairy treat, similar to yogurt but less sharp tasting. It's eaten the whole year round, but is served as a palate cleanser between huge roasted meals during Yuletide. While only wealthy Icelanders owned cows, most people historically lived on the farmsteads located on the land of the upper echelons. All were affected by the loss of milk. The third Yule lad, Stuver or Stubby, stole household pans in order to eat the delicious crusts that remained on them. While this seems benign, pots and pans were incredibly valuable in isolated Iceland. The country had no iron reserves or mining industry, so such goods had to be imported and were very expensive. For some impoverished families, they were the only valuable possessions they had. Thoris Lekir was the fourth Yule lad to come to town. His name means spoon licker. His game was breaking into the house of Icelanders to lick all the spoons of the household, hoping for a morsel to eat. He was grotesquely thin from malnutrition, which was unusual amongst trolls who were most often depicted as overweight and muscular. 
The lesson to be learned from Spoonlicker's behavior was that in order to avoid him, children should clean their cutlery. The fifth lad was also a glutton, Pottaskevil, known in English as pot scraper. He would break into one home after another and eat any food that had been left out, including pots of sauce, chunks of roast meat left on a tray, and saucepans with cooking oil left on them. As food was preserved and meant to last through the long winter months, any waste was greatly frowned upon. Pottaskevil probably was used to encourage children to finish their meals. The sixth lad, Askesleikir, is similar, but with a creepy edge. With a name meaning bowl liquor, Askesleikir slurped up the remains of whatever is left in bowls. Unlike his brethren, Askesleikir didn't wait until everyone was asleep to get into people's houses. He would hide beneath the bed, waiting for children to finish any nighttime snacks. When they finished, he'd snatch up the remaining food. Perhaps parents used this lad to discourage midnight snacks. Herdasketlir is the seventh lad, and his name means door slammer. Until the end of December, he went from home to home, breaking in and slamming as many doors as possible in the middle of the night. It's likely this lad had origins in the strong winter winds that blew through the turf houses of Icelanders, causing doors to slam and rattle. The eighth lad was Skirgamur, or Skirgabler. Undoubtedly conceived by parents to encourage their children to finish their skir, this lad ate up any skir left out overnight. Smoking meat is popular during the winter months, as it keeps longer. One of the favorite smoke dishes are sausages known in Iceland as buga. This was the favorite snack of the ninth lad, buknakrækir, or sausage snatcher. He would break into homes and hide in the rafters, waiting for dinner to be cooked before swooping down from above to snatch his favorite sausages. The tenth Yule lad to descend from the mountains was Glukkagair, or window peeper. The winters in Iceland are dark, with only four hours of sunlight a day. The fear Glukkagair must have inspired in children who glanced out of the windows, thinking this fearsome troll was looking in upon them, must have been significant. Gattafer, or doorway sniffer, the eleventh lad, also terrified Icelandic children. With his enormous nose, Gattafer came sniffing under doors in search of lefabrud, a delicious fried dough treat decorated with intricate designs. His origins may have been an explanation for the whistling breaths of wind that sped under doors throughout the winter. Meat was the preferred meal of the twelfth and penultimate Yule lad, Ket Kroker, or Meat Hook. Lurking behind doors, under tables, in cupboards, and outside open windows, he waited for meat to be placed on the counter. As soon as he could, he'd use his long meat hook and snag himself the centerpiece of a family meal. The final Yule lad is Kartasnikir, whose name translates to Candle Stealer or Candle Beggar. He emerged from the mountains on Christmas Eve and stole the candles from as many homes as possible. His goal was to eat the tallow from which the candles were made. To get as much of this tallow as possible, he stole from the easiest targets, children. He'd follow them into their bedrooms and take candles straight from their hands. The impact of his thievery was quite severe in the past. Candles were incredibly valuable. They provided the only light throughout the dark winter. Imagine the thought of having to spend months in true darkness because you'd been naughty and lost the family candles. The lads were santified in Kotlern's book in 1932. Their bellies grew rounder, their beards whiter and longer, and their pranks far less annoying. Instead of pranks nowadays, during the 13 days before Christmas, the Yule lads place small treats in the shoes of good children and potatoes in those of naughty children. Grilla also had an animal companion, an enormous black cat called Jólakötturin, or the Yule Cat. It was vicious, with huge teeth and big yellow eyes. Like Grilla, the cat had an appetite for human flesh, especially children. 
Not just any children, of course, just the children who didn't get new clothes as gifts during Yuletide. Yola Katurin has origins in the Dark Ages, between the 5th and 15th century. Throughout this time, Icelandic farmers typically made their own wool and their own woven and knitted clothing. The cat was likely created to inspire the children of farmers to finish processing the wool before winter. Those who finished were rewarded with new clothing, while those who didn't would be at the mercy of Jóla Kurturin. According to Arni Björnesson, the renowned Icelandic folklorist, the legend of the cat may have sprung from an old Icelandic phrase, dress the cat, or taken by the cat. It was used to describe what happened to those who didn't receive clothes. Cats don't change clothes, and that was the fate of those who didn't receive new ones. However, archaeologist Gudmundur Olafsson believes the Yule Cat is a parallel myth to other beings that accompanied St. Nicholas in many European folktales. Cats, especially black ones, have long been associated with witches and the devil. Perhaps a traditional Icelandic tale fused with a Christian belief, creating an evil cat who takes the sinners away. In the 19th century, when Jóla Kotturin became associated with Gríla, the lads, and Yuletide, the cat was said to prowl through the streets on Christmas night, peering through windows to see which children received clothes as gifts. If they received no clothes, the cat would eat the child's dinner, and then the child. The cat inspired hard work, appreciation of clothing as a gift, and charity. Many times, the children who knew they were getting new clothes at Christmas made clothing to give to children who were in need in order to save them from the Yule Cat. Today, Yola Katurin is much gentler. Children that don't receive clothes instead only have their dinner stolen, not their lives. Children make cats' tails from cardboard to hang up as decorations. The cat appears in Christmas ornaments, illustrations, and cards. Even Björk, the famous Icelandic singer, included a song about the cat on her Christmas album. These tales may seem particularly brutal to us in the modern Western world, but you have to keep in mind what a brutal landscape the people of Iceland were living in during the medieval period. The winters were incredibly dangerous. Starvation, freezing, and total darkness were a constant threat. Disobedient children who went out into the dark and snow would likely never return home. A lot of work needed to be done before the winter set in, and that required extra effort from all members of the family. Waste of food or unfinished warm clothing could negatively impact the whole family. Still, there are consequences for growing up surrounded by these frightening tales. The tales of Grilla and her family were so widespread and so traumatizing for children that in 1746, the Danish king who had control over Iceland at the time made it illegal for parents to use Grilla and her companions to frighten their children. Fear-inducing stories like these, especially when told by a trusted adult, can have a profound effect on a child. This can be good or bad depending on how the story is delivered and discussed afterward. It may help the child understand the world around them or create a lifelong phobia if not explained. This ban on Grilla may have been trying to reduce the negative effects, but it could also have to do with the Danish oppression of the Icelandic people, which was going on at the time. Outlawing Icelandic traditions was a method of control, and these tales were deeply embedded in Icelandic culture. So deeply embedded that the tales, or remnants of them, still cause both joy and fear in Icelandic children during Yuletide. There's even been a resurgence of the darker versions of these tales since the 80s. Arni Björnesson, the well-known folklorist, did meticulous research into Icelandic ritual calendars, including the origins of traditions connected with festivities and celebrations. He published his research in two books in 1980 and 1981. They were both bestsellers. His most recent collection of this research, Saga Dagana, or The History of Days, was published in 1994. His books are a great resource if you want to know more about Iceland and its folklore and culture. Recently, the National Museum of Iceland has attempted to revive the traditional versions of Grilla and her family as a way to preserve Iceland's heritage. 
Due to the terror-inducing elements of the tales, they face an upward battle, but I appreciate the traditional versions of these characters being preserved. They are far more interesting than the current popular Yuletide mythology, especially for morbidly curious folk like us. Happy Holidays and Happy New Year! Morbid Curiosity Podcast is produced by H. Lloyd. If you'd like to get in touch or suggest a morbid topic, you can do so on Facebook and Instagram at Morbid Curiosity Podcast, on Twitter at Morbid Podcast, and on our website, www.morbidcuriositypodcast.com. If you like the podcast, please share it with your friends and on social media. And please give us a rating on Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast app you use. This helps the MCP reach new listeners and expand this wonderfully creepy community. Thank you to everyone who has already done so. Because of you, the listeners, our creepy community is growing strong. The MCP has joined the Straight Up Strange Podcast Network, which hosts true crime, paranormal, history, science, folklore, and other enigmatic podcasts. Nothing is off-limits when you enter the world of Straight Up Strange. The MCP is also part of the Belfry Podcast Network, a haven for goth culture, featuring podcasts, blogs, and videos, all catering to the darker side of life. If you'd like to support the MCP, but would rather not become a patron, you can give one-time donations on our website. Also on our website are links to all our social media, a list of episodes, and our mailing address. We also have an Amazon wishlist at bit.ly slash morbidwishlist. That's B-I-T dot L-Y slash Morbid Wishlist. Any purchases from this list are greatly appreciated. We are eternally grateful for your support. My name is Hallie, and until next time, thanks for listening.